Welcome to the fourth episode of A History of Thrones, and this time I'm going to be focusing on Elizabeth Woodville. She was born in 1437, died in 1492, the Queen Consort of England to Edward IV. Uh, she was the grandmother of Henry VIII. And I will be comparing how the experiences of Elizabeth, her life story, is very much reflected in the character arcs of both Marjorie and Cersei. Elizabeth's first husband was Sir John Grey of Grobury, and he was a minor supporter of the Lancastrians during the civil war known as the War of the Roses. However, he would die at the Second Battle of St Albans in 1461 while fighting the Yorks for Lancaster. This would leave Elizabeth widowed and her next husband was a bit of a catch. As you may well have guessed from that clip, Elizabeth's next husband was the King of England, Edward IV. According to legend, and according to the BBC's White Queen, as you saw there, they may have met by a roadside as Elizabeth went to petition the rights of her sons, uh, seen in this photo, to the King. Um, however they met, they did come into contact, and they fell in love. So, she was formerly of House Lancaster, and now she's House York. She's traded, she's swapped sides. And this reminds me quite a lot of Marjorie. If you think back to Season 2, I know it was a long time ago, Marjorie was actually with Renly when we first met her, and House Tyrrell was a major supporter of Renly's Baratheon's claim. All it took was Renly's death, the Battle of the Blackwater, a little finger later, and it's... <laughs> Arguably, though, what Elizabeth done was even more impressive, because unlike the Tyrells in the, the, Tyrells in the Game of Thrones universe, Elizabeth's family weren't major political players in the English aristocracy, so not to mention she was already a widow with two children. So she did really well for herself, and this leads me to the only conclusion that she must have been a bit of a stunner, sort of a middle-aged 15th century Emily Ratatowski, in my opinion. So Edward and Elizabeth did marry, and they had lots of children, the three most noteworthy of which are seen below. However, it is the fate of the two boys, which still complexes and uh, draws debate amongst historians to this day. After his father's death, Edward V was on his way back from Wales when he was confronted by Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. Uh, Richard, seen here, was made Lord Protector by his brother, uh, Edward IV, on his deathbed. So the former king made him Lord Protector for his for his son, so for Richard's nephew, and he did crown him. Edward V ruled for about two months, making him the shortest ever reigning monarch in English history, before Richard here threw him in the Tower of London, said he was a bastard, and crowned himself Richard III. Hmm, claiming your nephew is a bastard so you can become the king? Who does this remind us of? But I'll come back to this later. So the custody of the two boys is known, and the mystery around their disappearance is known in the princes in the tower. These two boys were Edward V and his younger brother Richard, and they eventually vanished. They disappeared in the tower. They were most likely killed in the tower. Um, but no one really knows who by. A lot of people say it was Richard because, you know, he obviously was the king and he killed them because he didn't want a threat. But at the same time, Richard had already made himself king by the time the boys died, so there was no real reason to kill them other than to antagonise people. A lot of people think it could have been a lady called Margaret Beaufort who was laying the seeds for her son to become king. Um, but we'll investigate that later. What I'm going to draw now is a comparison with Elizabeth and Cersei. Because as much as we hate Cersei, you have to admit we feel for her when her children die. With Joffrey, 
Marcella and Tommen. Through the series of Game of Thrones, we see Cersei lose all her children, and it's very similar with Elizabeth. When these two women tried to climb the ladder for power in their worlds, it was their children who suffered. Elizabeth's uh, first sons from her first marriage were executed by Richard III. Obviously, the young king, the young princes were killed by Richard III, and Tom and Marcella and Joffrey all wiped out when these women were playing the Game of Thrones. But Cersei says it best herself. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. However, Elizabeth, she's a bit more tactile in her revenge than Cersei. Cersei's all blow up the seps, you know, kill them with poison, get the mountain on them and all that. Elizabeth, she's a bit more tactile and her revenge is a bit more long-lasting. From Sanctuary in Westminster Abbey, Elizabeth Woodville would plot her revenge on Richard III. Sanctuary was this sort of agreement that was had in the Middle Ages where... If you were a noble family and you were threatened by political rivals, you could claim sanctuary and the church would allow you to stay within the confines of of the consecrated ground of the church and they would give you protection and they would protect you and people would honour it because these were very religious, this was a very religious society and they did not want to incur the wrath of God. So technically Richard III, if he wanted to, could have marched in troops and killed Elizabeth. He knew she was plotting against him more than likely. He could have done that if he wanted to, but he didn't because, you know, he didn't want to piss off God. So Elizabeth laid the groundwork for this man's return to England, Henry Tudor. He was the last claimant from the Lancastrian side. So Elizabeth, she's gone back again. First she was Lancaster, then she was York. Now she's back sporting the Lancastrians again because she does not like the Yorkist King Richard III for obvious reasons, and she would be soon be made a very happy woman when Henry faced Richard. Defeated him at the Battle of Bosworth Field, making Richard III the last British monarch to die in battle, and that was nearly 500 years ago. And he was actually dug up very recently, I don't know if you remember in the news, uh, he was found buried in a car park in Leicester, So, and that was about five years ago or so, so all 500 years a uh, King of England remains were buried beneath a car park in Leicester. But they've recently been excavated. Um, I think you can go see them at some mu- museum or, or another. So a political allegiance was made. Our Elizabeth, Elizabeth Woodville, married her daughter, seen on this family tree, Elizabeth of York, nice and confusing, to Henry VII, and thus uniting the two warring houses of Lancaster and York, and creating the House of Tudor, the Royal House of Tudor, which has famous members such as Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. If you've all heard of the Tudors, if you've ever wondered why you've heard about the Tudors so much, it's because they they were the sort of family, the, the royal family, that took us out of the Game of Thrones world and allowed something of a renaissance to develop. And it could be argued planted the seeds of modernity, certainly of the early modern period. So that's it for this video. Next time I'm going to focus in more detail on Richard III and the very, very, very similar life experiences that he's had with Stannis Baratheon. It is it's quite remarkable. Um, but I'm also going to uh, have a look at how Richard's pub- the public perception of Richard has, has a lot of inf- implications for Tyrion's character as well. So yeah, that's it. And if you've enjoyed the video, please like and feel free to subscribe.